All right, here we go. Last lecture for the week. Then we've got a Wednesday off. Ugh. I love National If Pets Had Thumbs Day. It's a great week. I love having a Wednesday off. But this is the last lecture for the week, section 2.7. Welcome. It's good to see you here on the, on the video. Uh, this is a section on combining functions. So we've talked all about graphs of functions. We've talked all about, in the last section, even symmetries and translations of functions. In today's lecture, we're going to be looking at what happens when we take two functions or several functions and we start adding them together, we start subtracting them from each other, multiplying, dividing, and then even something called composing functions together, where you take the output of a function and you use it as the input of the next function. You can sort of chain functions along. Um, we're going to be talking all about those types of things. And what happens to things like domain and range of these, of these combinations of the functions? Everything boils down to finding domains and ranges of the original functions. But uh, we still need to, to go through this and look at what happens. So let's get started. Combining functions, 2.7. So as I said, we're going to be looking first at adding and subtracting functions together. And we'll take care of those rather quickly. So let's say we've got a function f with domain. And we'll just call the domain whatever it is, a. It's, it's some set in the real numbers. I don't know what it is. right? And we'll take another function g with some other domain, possible numbers, you know, b. I, I don't know what they are. But A is just the set of all numbers that you are allowed to plug into F. And F will tell you what to do with them. B is the set of numbers that you're allowed to plug into the function G. And G will know what to do with them. OK? So what about this? F plus G. What about its domain? Well. Let's think about what we're saying here. If I take an input, plug it into x, I take the same input, and plug it into g, I have to be able to do each of those individually. right? If I just willy-nilly pick an x out of the real number line, I need to know what to do with it in both cases where I'm plugging it into f and where I'm plugging it into, into g. What if x is in a but not in b? Well, then I can do this, but I don't know what to do with g of x. A nice example of that would be what if I'm squaring and then square rooting if I plug in a positive number, that's fine for x squared, but uh, excuse me, if I plug in a negative number, that's fine with x squared, but not for the square root. Well, we need to make sure that our input is allowed for both of them, right? The sum f plus g has the domain, it's related to a and b but it's only the overlapping parts. It's all those input that are in the intersection. Remember this symbol represents the intersection. Okay, it's, it's the opposite of this union symbol. That means logically or, so you're in either A or B. What we're talking about with this intersection is the input has to be in A and in B. So F plus G, you can only compute that if the input is allowed for both F and for G. Okay, so with that out of the way, we're, we're pretty much good to go. Uh, I just want to first show you a common way of simplifying the notation. So it is very common to write things like this f of x plus g of x. It is also very common to write something like this. 
the function name f plus g. Okay, that's kind of what I wrote here. I didn't write the of x parts. But f plus g is kind of like the new name for what we're doing here on the left. We're taking the function of f at an input x, and we're adding it to the function of g at an input x. And we'll, assign, we'll sort of assign a new name to that. And the new name is f plus g with an input list. Just like before, right? We input, or we, we, we list out all the inputs for our function in parentheses beside it. So we've got our new name, which is determined by the operation we're doing, addition, and our list of inputs, which is just x. So this is the new, this is a very, very common notation. for the sum or addition of two functions. It doesn't have to be two. We could have three functions or four functions, f plus g plus h, call the new name f plus g plus h with only one input. And that means we're taking the function f of x, we're adding it to the function g at x, and we're adding it to the function h at x. Okay, this is just a common notation for the sum of two functions. Okay, the next one uh, is dealing with subtraction. And first we'll look at the domains of the subtraction of functions. So I'm going to draw this in red instead of the black. So f minus g has domain and go figure, it's the same. That should make sense. What we're going to do is evaluate the function f and evaluate the function g at some input. That input needs to be allowed for both of them. So we have the exact same domain. It's the intersection of the two domains. The common notation <clears throat> is to replace that plus sign with a minus sign. So. This is also common notation for a difference of two functions. Okay. The next thing that we sometimes do is we multiply two functions together. So f of x times g of x. The common notation there, you, you could probably guess, f times g of x. Okay. Commonly, there's no dot there. right? That happens a lot with multiplication. We don't, we don't write that dot. It's just f times g with nothing in between. That means the product of the two functions. And what's the domain here? Well, let's think about what we would need to do. We pick an, in, we pick an, pick an input. We're plugging it into both functions and multiplying. Which means we need to be able to evaluate it for each function. So the input needs to be in both domains again. Okay. How about the next one? The next common thing you might want to do with two functions would be divide them. The common shorthand way is f over g of x. We're giving it again a sort of a new name, f over g, and we're listing the inputs here. What about this one's domain? Well, again, we need to be able to plug in that input to both functions, f and g. So we have, again, this intersection. Right? If we don't pick something that is in the domain of both, we can't evaluate the numerator and we, or we can't evaluate the denominator, one of the two. But this one also has the added, the added, I don't know, detractor. <laughs> the added element that we're dividing by something which sometimes causes issues so if g of x is 0 we got an issue so we're going to have to subtract from the set it looks like your book says it this way okay that's a good way of writing it for you um, your book writes it in set builder notation I think that's an easy way for you to, to do it so it's a set of all x's, 
such that g of x does not equal 0 and x is in a intersection b. Okay, so it's the set of every x, every input, where g is not 0. Okay, so you plug in x to g and you don't get a 0. That's good, that's what we need because we're dividing by g. And x is in the common domain between the two. So you pick something that's common to both and you don't get 0, then you've got it in your domain here. Okay, so let's, let's look at a few different things here, okay? Just a few different examples of this sort of thing. First one is f of x. 1 over x minus 2, g of x. Another function is square root x. Let's just do a couple of these. f plus g of x. Well, that's the same as f of x plus g of x. And that's the same as 1 over x minus 2. That's f of x plus square root of x. And if we wanted to find a common denominator, we could. We could go about that process. We'll leave it here. If I were to make this into a subtraction, all those signs would change. Nothing else. Okay, so given any two functions, here we go. That, that's how you can write down the sum or the difference. What about the domain? So here I'm going to write out A is the domain of F. So A is any number but 2, right? It's the set of all x's such that x is not equal to 2. Because if we have that, then we're dividing by 0, and that's a problem. g of x has domain b. g of x is the square root of x, which we know only accepts non-negatives. So it's a set of all x's bigger than or equal to 0. So I'm going to graph these on, num on a number line. So A, well actually I'm going to graph B first. B is anything bigger than or equal to 0. Right there. And A is everything but 2. So A is everything except 2. Okay, so there's a hole there. So where do they overlap? A intersect B. We know that's the domain of the sum. Right? F plus G has domain intersection of the two domains. So the domain is the intersection of the two, which is, just looking here, the overlapping parts. It's from 0 to 2, not including 2, together with 2 to infinity. We just look at both those sets individually, plot them, or just think about them. Then we look at where they have points in common. And that is the domain for the sum, or the difference, or the product, or the quotient, except for those parts where the denominator is 0. So this is going to be a really common thing. Speaking of products and quotients, let's do that. f g of x is that's 1 over x minus 2 times, uh, sorry, let me write this out more explicitly. This is the function f of x times the function g of x, which is 1 over x minus 2, that's f of x, times square root of x, which is square root of x over x minus 2. What's the domain? It's right there, right? Nothing changed. The products and sums, you find the domain the exact same way. It's just the intersection of the two domains. Products, sums, and differences are all the same. OK, so there's the product, and the domain is, boom, right there. Now for the hard part. f over g of x. 
So that's the function f of x divided by the function g of x. And that is, it's a compound fraction. 1 over x minus 2 over square root x. I'm going to multiply this by 1 over root x here and 1 over root x here. And that gives us 1 in the denominator. And it gives us this up top. It says 1 over square root x times x minus 2. OK. What's the domain? So it's very close to what we had before. It's the intersection, which was 0 to 2 together with 2 to infinity. But we need to take out those x values where the square root of x equals 0. Well, the square root of 0 is 0, so we need to take that out. So this set that we wrote down earlier for the quotient, it's the set of all x such that g of x is not 0, and x is in the intersection for this problem becomes this set, 0 to 2 together with 2 to infinity. We can't plug in 0 anymore because that gives us a 0 in our denominator. If we go back to what it looks like, we plug in 0 here, we get a 0 down there. We plug in 2, we get a 2 there. Or we get a 0 there. If we plug in anything negative, we've got negatives under a radical. So we've got to have all the positive numbers that are not 2. And that's what we've got. I know that was pretty fast, but this is on a movie, and you can rewatch it a couple times if you need to. But that, that's the basic process for finding for any product, for any quotient, sum or difference of two functions. That's the process of finding domains. You find the domains of each individually. You look at where their domains are the same, where they are, they have the same values. And then in the case of quotients, you look at where the denominator is 0 as well, and you take those out from the intersection, the common domain. OK? So that brings me to the hard topic for the day, as if that wasn't hard enough. I, I get that that's hard. But here's the hard topic for the day. Composition, not compositions, composition of functions. So composition of functions is, in lay terms or in maybe everyday talk, um, it's like a chain of things happening. One thing leads to another, leads to another, leads to another. It's like a, it's like a, a stack of dominoes falling over. You push the first, which pushes the second, which pushes the third, so forth and so on. Uh, it's this thing where the input turns into an output then that output becomes the input for the next and that output becomes the input for the next and so forth and so on composition is that process mathematically of taking an input to an output which becomes the new input. OK, so in, in, a, in a diagram sort of way, let's take some function f, which has a domain. So domain of f here. Let's put x in there. The function f takes this x and it sends it to f of x, right? So that's what our function f does. It links or it maps an, an input to an output. So this is now the output or the range of f. And what we're going to do next is we're going to take another function g 
and we're going to treat this as the domain of G. Uh, let me put that on top. So if f of x is in the domain of G, we can plug it in. So this gets taken to another point. G handles that for us. It's G, and the input is the previous output, f of x. And this is the range of G. Okay. So this is like a it's like a handoff situation, you know, passing the baton situation, uh, dominoes falling over into the next situation. It's a a, a a collision situation where you run into something which runs into the next thing which runs into the next thing. In the case of my daughters, that happens a lot, <laughs> and uh, it, it's it's this mathematical thing that it, it can be a little bit difficult to understand and to grasp, but overall. It's, it's a process that is just that handoff, right? It's not too difficult to understand, but it gets difficult when you start putting algebraic symbols to it. So let's look at a basic example. Uh, oh, sorry, first. How do we denote this? So, so this right here. Notice we ended up with G where the input was F of X. The way that we denote this is with a circle. So the way to write this is G circle. It's like a little circle, not a dot. F. This is the new name to this. And it means take your input, X, plug it into F, and then plug that into G. So we can see that that's what happened here. We took our x, we plugged it into f, and then we plugged that into g. Okay. So this is how we usually denote this circle means compose. Use the output of one function as the input for the next. So here's our first example. We're going to suppose f of x is x squared. So what that means is the input, we just square it. And that's what our function f does. g of x is x minus 3. So whatever the input is, we're just going to subtract 3. Okay. Now, I want to really quickly ask what the domain of each of these is, because that can be important. I notice that this first one for f, it's just square things. So the domain of f is all reals. Doesn't matter. All real numbers. Domain of g, same. I can subtract 3 from any real number. Okay. The intersection of these two is all real numbers. So we don't have any issue here. Okay, there's there's no issue. Um whatever the function f does, it's going to give us a real number out and we can plug that into g. Whatever g does, right? It it just takes a real number and it gives a real number out as well. So since the domain of f is any real number, we can go ahead and we can plug anything that we want into g and then plug that into f. There's no, there's no conflict for these domains and ranges. But we can have issues like that, so that's an important thing to note. So here we go. Um, what is f composed with g of x? And what is g? composed with f of x. So this first one says g is the first function that we do, and we plug that into f. So f with g plugged into it, which is, well, f is square, right? You square the input. So f means to square whatever we take in. 
So we're going to square g of x. Because that's the input now. And g is x minus 3. So this is x minus 3 squared. And there we have it. We, we could we could multiply that out, x squared minus 6x plus 9. That's OK. Either way is fine. This is the composition of f composed with g for an input x. Right there. Boom. How about the other way around? Is it always the same? The answer is definitely not. So here, we're using as the input for g, we're using the whole function of f. So this is g, where we plug in f of x. Well, that's what, what is g? g means to subtract 3. So we're going to take something and subtract 3. And what is that something? Well, it's the whole function f of x. Right, if we look back at g, it's just take the input, subtract 3. What's our input here? It's the whole function f of x. So we're going to take f of x minus 3. Well, f of x is x squared. And so there we have it. That's as simple as we can make it. We could factor this, right? x minus root 3, x plus root 3. But that's it for the most part. That's, that's how we're going to save it. g is composed with f of x is x squared minus 3, or factored x minus root 3, x plus root 3. This is how you work out composition. Okay, Function composition is very, 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 very powerful. It's a very, very important way of combining functions together because it's, it's so, so prevalent. I mean, you think of anything that you do in life like baking, right, or, or getting dressed in the morning. There's a certain order of things that needs to happen and they, one thing leads into the next, which leads into the next. And so you're just, you take something original, you modify it slightly, and then you input that into another process and you modify it slightly again. You take that as the new input and you continue this process, the whole manufacturing process for anything, a car, a phone, anything. It's, it's literally this composition of one function after another. Now whether or not these things are mathematical is a whole nother story, but I would encourage you to think of the processes that you encounter, uh, maybe think of them as compositions. Um, and when you do go into a job someday and you're working in industry, it may really pay dividends to really mathematically look at what you're doing, what you're producing. Look at it as a composition, perhaps the cost of things at each step, and you're looking at the compositions of things from one to the next, or the efficiency of some process from one step to the next. You're looking at the compositions of these things. And then you can use that to drive how you do these things, or if you do certain processes, to help you sort of optimize some sort of control or some operation or some procedure in your business. So when can function composition get you in trouble? It's pretty simple. Okay, so function composition. I don't, I don't think that we talk about this right now, actually. So maybe I shouldn't go into this. But I will give you a basic thing. So remember that I had this domain of f bubble here. And then we have the range of f bubble. And so f takes an input x in its domain and maps it to a range of you know, whatever it is. You could run into problems, right? Because g in function composition takes that input. So g does this, f does this. We're supposing right now that this entire range of f is allowed for g. But what if it's not? What if 
the function f can output something that g doesn't know what to do with. A very simple example is, let's let f of x equal x minus 3. And we'll let g equal square root of x. That's so simple. Just subtract 3 from a number. Oh, then take the square root of it. Yikes, you can't do that all the time. Right? What if you plug in some x, uh, let's see, less than 3. Looks like a heart. x less than 3 less than the number 3. Well, if you plug in an x less than 3, this becomes negative, and you can't plug it into g. So what's the domain of f of g and g of f? These are very important questions to try and answer. And in large part, it boils down to sort of the second function, what it can accept. You know, what is its domain? And how does that correspond to the range of the first function? Okay, and as I said, I'm pretty sure we're going to get into this at a later time. So I'm not going to spend more time on it here. But that's just something to consider is with function composition, you have to make sure that the outputs line up with the inputs along that chain, along that process. And that's all I've got for you today. So that was section 2.7 on uh, combining functions. So we looked at how to add and subtract and multiply and divide and compose functions together to create new functions. We talked about some of the notations for those new function names, f plus g of x, f minus g of x, g circle x, <laughs> sorry, g circle f, or g circle, uh, f circle g, um, these different new names that we give them. Uh, and we talked a lot about their domains and how these domains need to line up and work well with each other. So I hope that helps with your homework. That's it for this week. That is the three sections that I was supposed to be lecturing on. The quiz on last week's stuff is, is this Friday still. That's not changing. The homework for this stuff is due the 8th, I think. The 8th of, sorry, uh, yes, the 8th of March. Um, and again, there's no class this Wednesday. It's National If Pets Had Thumbs Day. So, so, I don't know, take your pet for a walk if it's going to be nice. Uh, go buy a pet if you don't have one. Uh, if you're a student, I'd recommend a fish, right? At very low cost, uh, very little sentimental value. If it doesn't last or go over too well, <laughs> so that's what I would recommend. It's also great if you've got kids. So with that, I'll let you go. Have a great day, and have a great National of Pets Head Thumbs Day. I'll see you next time.